All right. Well, it's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit. I've had a wonderful time talking with people this afternoon. You have an amazing community. Um, and um, what I'm going to be talking about today are abstract concepts. It's a, it's, this is actually not a, top, a talk I usually give, and I don't exactly remember why we decided event, ultimately on, on, on this particular thing, but I actually love talking about this work, and it's something we're really interested in and, and in continuing to explore in a variety of ways that I, I probably won't say much about. But um, in general, an abstract concept is uh, it's a concept that refers to entities that aren't completely physical. Um, nor spatially constrained, so like a chair is largely physical, even though you can make some arguments about non-physical things not involved in it, it's spatially constrained, whereas like truth, you know, it's much more amorphous. And I think it's uh, fair to say that these kinds of concepts are not very well understood, especially relative to concrete concepts like chair and hammer, which are the kinds of concepts that are most frequently studied, uh, presumably because they're the easiest to study. And when people have looked at abstract concepts, they primarily studied them in terms of how well you can remember them, how easily you can access them, and as I'll describe later, kind of the kinds of ways, the, the codes they're represented in, like language and imagery. But I think what the really important thing ab about abstract concepts that we don't understand is we don't really understand what's in them, what their content and structure is. And I think there's a remarkable um, kind of lack of understanding about, about this that I think is really unfortunate because I, I think these concepts are, um, you know, it's not just that they're interesting. I suspect that they're at the heart of what makes humans the way they are. Uh, we, th these concepts organize a tremendous amount of our cognitive activity. And if we don't understand them, there's probably going to be a lot about cognition we don't understand. Another reason I'm interested in these concepts is because I, uh, uh, I study cognition from the perspective uh, of, of grounding, simulation, embodiment, situatedness. And people often say, well, okay, you know, that approach will work fine for concrete concepts like hammer and chair, but you know, how about abstract concepts like truth and justice? And, um, so for that re that's another reason I've been very interested in these concepts is as, you know, kind of um, trying to see whether or not there are interesting things that can be said about them from this perspective or whether we just have to leave them to other perspectives. I think it's also worth noting, though, that it's not just grounded theories that don't have a lot to say about these concepts. It's all theories of cognition. Even traditional theories, I think, have very little, you know, have, have really figured out very little about, or, or, or proposed much about what's going on with these concepts. So what I'm going to do is, uh, this is an overview. I'll first of all talk about the accounts of abstract concepts that exist, how they're studied. Um, and then I'll talk about some preliminary, preliminary work from uh, my lab that looks at the content of abstract concepts. And then I'm going to focus mostly on how um, these, these concepts might be represented. And it, this, will, this is where things like the, 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 the topics of language and simulation will come in. Okay. So perhaps, the, in, at least in, since the cognitive revolution, the dominant account of abstract concepts has been Pavio's dual code theory. And for those of you who don't know uh, this theory, Pavio argued that there are two fundamental systems in the cognitive system, the image-based system and the language system. He argued that they were both symbolic. And one of his primary arguments is that concrete concepts are coded in both systems. You have imagery-based representations of objects and also language-based representations. But what he argued about abstract concepts is that they're primarily represented in the linguistic system and that they don't have the same kind of image-based representations that concrete concepts have. I'll talk more about this theory a little later. Another central account of abstract concepts comes out of cognitive linguistics, conceptual metaphor theory proposed by Lakoff and Johnson in the 80s. And basically their argument was that co abstract concepts are just difficult to understand and represent, and so what people do is that they represent them metaphorically with concrete concepts which are easier to understand and represent. So you understand anger, for example, using metaphors of like exploding hot water and exploding boiling water and exploding containers. Um, and that, so, this is, so th th um, th this is another proposal about how these concepts are represented. Just one sort of point about this theory, which was made by Greg Murphy in the 90s and many other people have made it since, is that for the metaphor theory to work, to map a concrete concept into an abstract domain to explain the abstract domain, 
you need to have some kind of structure in the abstract domain. Otherwise, there's no way to project the representation of the concrete concept into the abstract domain. So that must mean that there's some kind of structure and content in the abstract domain for that projection to work. Another um, well-known theory of abstract concepts and uh, it was proposed by Paul Schwanenflugel and um, Ed Chauvin in the 90s. And what they noted was that um, they first of all propose that all concepts um, are tend to be situated, that when you understand a concept like a hammer, you don't just think of a hammer in isolation, you think of a hammer in the situations where it's used. And they are also argued that the same thing is true of abstract concepts and that in fact abstract concepts depend more on situations than concrete concepts. Interestingly, though, they argued that abstract concepts have a harder time pulling up relevant situations. And um, so that uh, what, what they were interested in, were, were, there are all these differences in the older cognitive literature showing that generally concrete concepts are easier to remember, easier to process you know, on a variety of tasks than are abstract concepts. And they, what they basically argued is that this is because all concepts need situations in order to make sense of them but it's harder to pull up situations from memory for abstract concepts than it is for concrete concepts. And they offered this in really incredible evidence, um, which I don't really think has been appreciated as much as it should be, which is that when you give people good contextual information for abstract concepts, all of the differences between these two kinds of concepts disappear. You become just as efficient at processing abstract concepts as concrete concepts once you give people situational information. Okay, the last theory I'm going to talk about is perceptual symbol systems, or kind of the, the approach that I take. And um, in the original proposals of this theory, there were various uh, arguments about how abstract concepts would be handled within this framework. One particular argument was that metaphor is not necessary, the way like Lakoff and, and Johnson argue. And this is because um, it, it goes back to the projection problem that Murphy noted. There's already structure about abstract concepts that can be used to represent them. That's not to say that metaphors don't come along and later project into that structure, but that there's structure there that can be used in experience that, and can be processed from, from the perspective that perceptual symbols talks about, and I'll, I'll go into more detail on that later. Um, and in addition, this approach argued heavily that, like based on Schwanenflugel's work, that, um, that, uh, that abstract concepts depend tremendously on, the si on situations and draw a lot of their semantics from the situations in which they're used. Okay, I'll come back to the theories a little later, but what I want to talk about next are methodological approaches, typically how these concepts have been studied in the literature. Typically, these concepts have been studied in a very kind of classic cognitive way by just studying them as independent words, um, not, in, not often in context except for the Schwann and Flugel work. And in general, in most exper experiments, concrete words are, are contrasted with abstract words and then various memory and processing differences are noted. And pretty much all, most of the things we know about abstract concepts have come from this kind of paradigm. I increasingly believe that um, because these concepts do depend so much on situations, that we need to, um, we need to, we need to start studying them more in the situations in which they're used. And we'll learn a lot of important things from them that we, we won't learn uh, from studying them in word lists. So basically, um, what, what we've increasingly come to believe is going on with abstract concepts to put them in a more ecological or naturalistic context is that in the domains of, in which people operate, what, what, what we're going to call here paradigms of human activity, that any given paradigm of, of human activity typically has a whole host of abstract and also concrete concepts that are necessary to kind of be effective in that domain. So for example, in research, you can't do research unless you know a whole host of abstract concepts like observation, evidence, theory, hypothesis, explanation. And this is true of, of, of virtually any, any domain in which um, humans operate. And this is why I think they're so central to cognition, and until we understand how these concepts work, we're not going to understand what's going on in, 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 in domains like these. So just to give a little bit more specific um, examples of, of, of how this might work, imagine like in law, how various abstract concepts contribute to comprehension, prediction, action, and evaluation. If you're watching a court case and you're just trying to follow what's happening, you're not going to be able to understand what's going on unless you understand all sorts of abstract concepts like prosecution, defendant, law, felony, verdict, and so forth. 
Knowing those concepts is essential to understanding that activity. Similarly, you can't make predictions. We, in basic, one of the most basic things that people do are just constantly generate predictions. So you, you need to, to follow a court case, you need to know that when a crime occurs, this typically produces evidence, that uh, once you have evidence, this bears on whether a verdict is reached or not, and uh, if a verdict is reached, what the sentence is. So you, need, you need to, you, not only do you understand these concepts, you understand how these systems of concepts are organized so that you can generate all sorts of predictions and other kinds of inferences that are essential in following the activity in that domain. If you're actually a player in one of these domains, um, these concepts specify how you should act. And so one nice thing about coming for, uh, up at concepts from the grounded or embodied perspective is we assume that concepts are not just kind of static data structures as they are in typical cognitive theories. We assume that they actually control the body, emotion, and so forth, so that um, that they actually specify actions that you take in particular situations where they're relevant. So, for example, if you're a lawyer, um, you need to know concepts for things like argue, object, overrule, sustain, and you also need to know how to carry out the appropriate actions for each of those, um, which we would assume is part of the concept. And then finally, um, in order to evaluate uh, all sorts of things that are happening in this context, you need a variety of other concepts like legality, strength, justice, effectiveness, and so forth, um, in order to be sophisticated about this kind of activity. So again, the point is, is that these kinds of concepts are, are um, uh, these abstract concepts seem to be central to, to, to dealing with the domain. And um, I think I'm going to skip this study just in the interest of time, so, but we did a kind of a, a, a scaling study trying to scale, to identify the organization of abstract concepts to test this hypothesis, and we used kind of a LSA type of approach. And basically what we found is that um, when you look at how abstract concepts cluster together in, in, in sets, they seem to or, be organized thematically. And so kind of we were talking about thematic organ, organization a lot today, I mean, we think that these kind of thematic organizations of concepts are sets of things that support processing in a particular kind of situation. So when you come into a situation and you're, and you're acting intelligently in it, it's because you know all these, all these relevant concepts and how they're thematically related in all sorts of ways. And basically what this study did was offer support for that, that concepts get organized together to the extent that they are used together in the same situation. So... Um, now this, this next study looks at the third thing that I wanted to start with, which is the content of abstract concepts. And again, I think we don't know very much about the content of abstract concepts at, at the moment. And th this was sort of an exploratory study to try to get a sense of what this content might be. So it's done, um, uh, well, I, well, actually, I haven't gotten to the study yet. Um, kind of the basic idea that uh, we've been working with in terms of their content is that um, Kind of like Schwanenflugel at all, we assume that all concepts are situated. You don't, you don't process concepts independently of situations. You process them in situations. Um, and that uh, this is true of all concepts, both concrete and abstract, just like Schwanenflugel uh, proposed. And that the, the difference between them is, is in what they pick out of situations, what they individuate in situations. So on the one hand, concrete concepts individuate um, things that tend to be out there in the world and tend to be locally, spatially, like a table is out there in the world and it's in one part of, um, of, 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 the, of, of the space that surrounds me and it tends to persist in, in, the, in the same state over time. In contrast, abstract concepts are, are much more um, all over the place. They, they don't just exist in the, ex they don't just pick out stuff in the external world. Often they pick out a lot of stuff inside a person often inside um, their, in their cognitive system, their cognitive experience, also to some extent inside their body when they become affective. Um, but what's interesting about them is that they don't just seem to be in one place the way that concrete concepts often are, or at least are more so. Abstract concepts seem to be distributed over complex events that are changing over time, so they're referring to a, often a, a, a complex pattern of information in, in space and time that is often linked with an agent's internal states as well. So basically, the way we think about these two kinds of concepts is in both cases you start with a situation, but for concrete concepts you end up picking up, they tend to refer to things in the world that are somewhat localized, whereas abstract concepts are picking up much more complex configurations of information that often include mental states. 